This is the second episode of the Nakazawa Show. Thank you so much again for joining. Today we'll be talking about a management-related topic, and、um, it is March thirty-first, two thousand twenty, and this is going to take a little bit longer than last time, about twenty minutes. The topic is the Nakazawa Management Startup Pack. It's been almost five years since I switched to engineering management. I'm by no means an expert engineering manager, and I'm always looking to improve. However, most managers will define their manager principles in the first couple of years of their management career. I think of this post as the Nakazawa Management Startup Pack, and I'm curious to see how it evolves over the years. If you know me on the post, you can see a few startup packs that people have made about me in the past. So first, the question I ask when I interview people is, why do you, why did you switch into management? It's one of my all-time favorite questions when I interview other managers for a position. Many people tell stories about how they found out that they were really good at helping others grow in their career. Many others will give more questionable justifications and appear selfish or seeking a special status, which you know I guess is also a useful signal for evaluating them. Here's my answer upon reflecting on myself. I tend to stumble into opportunities because of my curiosity and naivety. I had some managers who were not enjoyable to work with. I believed that I could both manage myself better and do a better job looking at managing others. The primary way I learned that I'd love to be an engineering manager, though, came from my time working on Jest. I was the only engineer dedicated to the project, and we didn't have any headcount to put together a whole team that could execute on the vision that I、um, outlined. My only option was to make the project exciting and look for passionate people who contribute as a side project、um, or maybe even on their own time. And you know, I look back at it fondly as it was a great time to work on JavaScript infrastructure. But there were maybe a few nights too many in which I spent time on open source support. While I made many engineering contributions to Jest, I am most proud about helping many others contribute to Jest, help them grow in their careers, and build an active, self-sustained community of contributors. First time management challenges. I knew about management concepts and thought I knew what management might be like. Yet I had no idea about the extreme information overload I was about to experience. It took me at least six months until I got comfortable, and more than a year to deal with this much information effectively. There were several other、uh, first-time challenges: broken team dynam, <clears throat> broken team dynamics. The first team I managed had broken dynamics. It was far from a high-performing team, and while we improved substantially over time, we never got the team co- cohesion quite right. We ended up with project silos within the group. Managing underperformers. I got thrown into a situation where I had to deal with multiple underperformers right away. While I managed to navigate it, maybe okay. This experience made me more reluctant about managing poor performance later on. It made me work harder to support people, but I also might have gone too easy on some folks instead of holding them accountable for repeatedly making similar mistakes. Hiring. I somehow had assumed that hiring the best talent onto your team wasn't that hard. It never looked like it took much effort when somebody you know new showed up on the team that I was on, and I was so wrong.、Um, and naive again.、Um, hiring is so much harder than I expected. The primary takeaway for me was the delete time it takes from identifying t- a talent to hire and fully ramping someone up on a team can easily take anything between three to nine months. Before I un- before <clears throat> I only knew、um, a small slice of that process. Once I got more involved with recruiting, interviewing, onboarding, and ramping up senior engineers, I had to learn how to be more strategic about long-term investments rather than thinking about、um, papering over short-term gaps. And then finally,、uh, in terms of first-time management challenges, the team makeup. One of my mentors early on gave me the advice to build the most senior team that I can build. It was undoubtedly well-intentioned, but it led me down a path of hiring only very senior folks and focus on career growth of individuals with little consideration for how the team might develop as a whole. I've since learned that two things are always true: one, a team will always have gaps, and two, a healthy distribution of seniority on the team is as important as the evolution as that of that seniority as individuals progress through steps in their careers, through you know their own growth or promotions. Finally, before we go into priorities, I want to talk about failures. The first time I became a manager, I took it extremely seriously. I still do, you know.、Um, I feel a great sense of responsibility towards my manager 
my own manager and my reports. But I tried to do everything as correctly as possible back then. I didn't have all the positive manager behaviors internalized and mostly emulated what I assumed were good management behaviors from observing others. It was only years later that I realized just how many mistakes I made on the first team that I managed. I did many things right, but I also hired the wrong people for the wrong reasons and set the wrong goals for a project that needed different outcomes. And I was terrible at building trust with, with one of my engineers and some of my reports. Fail failures on their own don't lead to growth. It's what you do after a failure happens. Plenty of people will not even recognize or self-reflect when they failed and lose out on all the upside of skill improvement. My failures shaped me as a manager. Priorities helped me avoid making the same mistake twice. They enable me to build high-performing teams in which individuals take ownership over their careers, and ultimately all that leads to better outcomes for the business, organization, and the individuals. So let's talk about those priorities. In the previous post about developer experience principles, we introduced the concept of a principle stack. For this post, I choose to list priorities without ranking them. They're all roughly of equal importance, and an effective engineering manager will know when to make trade-offs to adjust their approach for a tricky situation or a specific person with individual needs. We'll cover the following priorities. Build for optimism, trust, embrace change, transparency, care, accountability, and recognition, scope through delegation, cohesion, vulnerability, and selflessness. I want to be clear here, um, this is not in the text, but I feel like I'm conflating a bunch of priorities that could be subdivided into multiple different groups and multiple different things, but this is currently the best that I've got, and I do think those priorities are pretty important. Please don't be surprised if in a couple of years from now, or maybe even in a couple of months from now, I might just completely redo this whole thing. However, the core and the essence and um, um, what these priorities are about, well, I don't think will change. The titles or something like that might change at the organization. First, build for optimism. So far, I got to build two teams as a manager. The first team was seeded with people who weren't precisely optimists. If you are listening to this, you know who you are. Um, even after they left the team, I noticed that the culture defined in the early days persisted for the duration of the team's existence. I made it my mission to seed new teams with optimists, focused on, what the, uh, on that with the second team that I built, and I noticed an incomparably better result. The team culture was better, um, and with it came an increased sense of belonging, more mutual respect for each other, and a can-do attitude. The second priority, trust. The amount of trust in a manager has a high correlation with how happy people are in their jobs. When people are working in a high trust environment, it means they feel safe to take risks, and it also usually comes with a level of autonomy that allows people to be self-directed. I strive to build a high trust environment with people reporting to me, not just with me, but also among each other. From experience working with various managers, there are four different positions people can be in based on trust and the amount of direction that they receive with their manager. So on the post, there will be a chart where the trust is the y-axis and the direction is the x-axis. And if you have high trust and high direction, that's really great because you, you have trust from your manager and they give you direction so you know what you're doing. If you're more experienced, you might have high trust and low direction, which is also great because your manager trusts you to do the right thing and you are self-directed to figure out what you need to do. When you're below that like line where you either have low trust and low direction or low trust and high direction, that's when things get troublesome. First off, if you join a new team, you might start out with new people. You might start out with low trust and low direction. In this case, it can work out fine. And most of the time it does. It is a bit of a risky um, um, situation. But if you can start building trust and you can figure out what you're going to work on somehow, you know, depending on your level of seniority, then, you know, if you're very experienced, then that will usually work out. If you are less experienced and you have low trust, but also you don't get any direction, that might be a case where um, you're going to get into trouble. If you are having low trust and low direction, but then you build high trust, you might be able to figure direction out. Finally, if you're in this territory where you have low trust, but your manager gives you a high, amount direction, uh, high, uh, high level of direction, that might be a very critical situation. I was in a situation like that once, and it's not awesome because you 
don't you're not trusted to do the thing that you're supposed to do right but you're also given all the work that you need to do so you're not self-directed it's very hard to move on from that either you change that into a high trust environment by building a lot of trust with your manager or you might end up actually doing something else and joining a different team the important thing i think here is that trust trumps everything you know, the amount of direction can generally be a, uh, um, adjusted when there is a high amount of trust. One person who used to report to me taught me the value of trust and creating win-win situations, not just by being incredibly patient with me, but also by sharing a wonderful small game that's linked in the post. Here are three primary takeaways. One, trust keeps relationships going. Two, incentives must be non-zero sum and situations must have win-win situations for every participant. And three, a large amount of miscommunication will lead to trust breaking down. The third priority, embrace change. This priority purely exists as an important reminder. Change requires hard work and is usually out of my comfort zone. I like stability. I mean, you know, most people don't like to, the rug to be pulled out from under them all the time. Yet change tends to happen and it's necessary to keep in mind how it affects people. Different people will react differently to change, have various concerns, and take different amounts of time to process change. Managers should handle transitions by informing people individually in one-on-one -on -one chats and looking at the positive outcomes a change may enable. A messaging plan helps deliver the news. For example, let's say there is an organizational change like a manager change or a reorganization that will impact the team. I, or the relevant management team, will prepare a messaging plan to communicate the changes usually contains information, information about the transition, various written announcements to be shared with different groups, a timeline detailing the rollout plan, and a list of anticipated questions and talking points. While it's easiest to announce a significant change to everyone simultaneously, the most gentle approach usually takes days of communication in one-on-ones because the amount of time increases with the change's complexity and how many people are affected. The payoff, though, is that it's easier to get everyone on the same page and you'll get a head start on the new setup after successfully completing uh, or executing on the messaging plan. The, the fourth uh, priority is, that I have is transparency. I attempt to build an accurate mental model of everything around me, as well as mental models that other people might have. It helps me make better decisions and allows me to relate better to people around me. For that, I demand as much transparency as possible from my manager, and similarly, I strive to pass on as much information as, information as possible to people reporting to me. I do hold back on information that I know will needlessly worry or overwhelm somebody when it won't materially influence them. Transparency makes it easier to rationalize decisions, understand the perspective of leadership, and ultimately puts the burden on the directly responsible individuals to make decisions with the full context, in a way more transparency automatically leads to delegation. Transparency also allows separating the facts behind a decision from my own opinion on various matters. As a manager of engineers, I'm aware that only a few important decisions are really up to me. Decisions are either made by layers above me or delegated to people reporting to me. When I disagree with a decision that wasn't up to me, it can be useful to share my perspective and why my view might may differ from the, uh, those of the decision makers. While it may not affect any outcomes, candidness builds trust. Sharing an honest dissenting opinion about a significant change can backfire and set you, you and the team back. I may choose to share my assessment of a situation only with people with a high emotional intelligence and with whom I have mutual trust. Keep that in mind. The fifth priority is care. I genuinely care about people and their experiences. They choose to work with me and it is my responsibility to help them make the most of it. I focus on understanding people's strengths and helping them understand their strengths, how their work relates to business impact, career growth, and whatever it takes to make everyone feel included. I don't see my responsibility ending when people stop reporting to me, you know, either by switching teams or by leaving the company. I care about people being satisfied with their career and progress and sometimes that means not actively working with me any, any longer. I'm happy to be there for people at every step of their careers and sometimes even their personal life. To be clear, I don't aim to become friends with people reporting to me, but sometimes that happens and it can be nice. Sometimes I become with friends, uh, I become friends with people after we don't work together any longer. Care may be among the best things I offer to people working with me. 
Most of the time though, the best thing about someone is sim simultaneously the worst thing. I tend to care so much that when somebody isn't doing well, I can't stop thinking about it, even when I'm not working. I want everyone to succeed and try to find a path to success. You know, if there was an off switch for this, please tell me how to find it. The sixth priority is accountab accountability and recognition. People must be held accountable for progress towards goals and the impact that they are having. Accountability often comes with a slightly negative connotation, like being held responsible for failure. In reality, accountability is a spectrum from misses to achievements. People want to be recognized for the things they're doing well, but that's only meaningful when there's a general understanding that everyone will be held accountable for misses as well. The usual process I apply is to define expectations for each individual at the beginning of a cycle. I write and share one expectation and growth document for each person reporting to me. While I'm there for people to help them navigate their careers, they have to own their path there themselves. And as part of that, each person has to agree to expectations and growth areas. Ideally, this is a collaborative process. Based on experience and self-awareness, I will ask some people reporting to me to write their own expectation document. After we agree on the document's contents, it serves as a blueprint to track progress, and it allows holding people accountable for both success and failure. A large part of recognition has to do with managing up to one's own manager. Whenever there's something great or critical about somebody, I share that with my manager. I serve as an advocate for the people around me. I'm responsible for making my manager understand all parts of the team's health and functioning, including how awesome people are. Keep in mind that small, isolated incidents are not worth sharing most of the time. Being an advocate also mean, means being protective, and it's critical to give each person the psychological safety they can fail without pointing fingers at them. That said, it is crucial to share themes like when somebody continues to damage relationships or disrupts team dynamics. Number seven, scope through delegation. I prioritize making myself obsolete. Of course, that never actually happens, and the intent is to delegate as many things as possible over time to create scope for other people and help them with their growth. That doesn't mean blindly dumping all of my work on others and playing you know, with the hacky sack on the roof, but it is entirely about waiting for the right opportunities and moments and being sensitive about when people are ready to take on more responsibility. Delegation has a noticeable effect that it also frees up my time to take on responsibilities and work that is challenging and pushes me out of my own comfort zone, leading to growth. Number eight, cohesion. I learned the importance of cohesion for managing a team where it was missing altogether. We were working on three distinct projects with little collaboration and little overlap. Pretty quickly, people would start asking questions about why they were on the same team. And that's even worse when people outside the team start noticing and asking hard questions too. While we had a sound vision and a mission for the team, and on some level it made sense for us to work on all those projects, the concrete manifestation of our actual work was based on individual projects instead of shared goals and focus. It's important to split people across different pillars or focus areas when a team grows in size, but it is equally important to create opportunities for everyone to coll collaborate. In high-performing teams, people tend to depend on each other. Two main ingredients helped me achieve cohesion, cohesion later on. One, mentorship structures. Identify or create genuine situations in which people need to help each other out. Pair up new hires with a social buddy and a technical buddy. Pair up experienced people with each other to help them fill gaps. Second, shared goals and a sense of belonging. If everyone is aligned on why they are here and what they are working towards, the team will be better off as there's an incentive to collaborate and help each other grow. Growth documents that I mentioned previously are fantastic instruments to strengthen the cohesion on the team. While there might be shared goals that everyone is aware of, there, may, there might be little collaboration. Growth documents can serve as a way to nudge people in specific directions. Let's say two people work on different pillars. One of them is more experienced and wants to improve their mentorship skills, and the other is less experienced and needs to learn more about project management. In this hypothetical scenario, I may define concrete expectations about how I expect them to improve in those respective areas and suggest working with each other. Almost always this has second order benefits when suddenly one person understands something about the work another part of the team is doing and will suggest improvements that people haven't thought about before. Number nine, vulnerability. In high performing environments, many people will suffer from imposter syndrome. I aim to be an anchor and source of stability in volatile times 
but I also know when to display my vulnerabilities, whether in team meetings or one-on-ones, showing vulnerability with personal stories or anecdotes, and talking openly about mistakes and failures makes people feel more included and gives them opportunities to open up. Just make sure not to make it too awkward, okay? Selflessness. I want to support people to do remarkable work. I don't want to be in the limelight. I want to be the light for others. Oh, wow, that's, I wrote something super cheesy here. Um, I believe if I do everything to help others, good things will happen to me too. Management is hard because you need to show your reports that you're bringing value to them. Some of my past managers made me feel like it was all about them. And great managers show a genuine interest in their reports' careers and then follow through by being actually good for their careers. Being good for somebody's career doesn't just mean handing out bonuses and promotions for no good reason. It means helping people learn their strengths, giving them perspective on challenging situations, finding mentors for them, and coaching them through tough times. It means helping them understand what they want to get out of their career long term, not just in their current role or company, and then finding a way to enable them to reach those goals. I strive to do this every day. And also, I totally get the irony that I talk about selflessness in a post that is so self-centered on my experiences and values. Anyway, further reading, there are some manager readmes on the post that I linked um, where you can learn more about how other engineering managers operate. Growth genuinely matters to me. I'm happy to have written down what I learned and how I operated in recent years, but I'm terrified of looking back at this post two years from now. I'm curious how I'll change and improve, and I hope to share an update one day. If you like this, please subscribe or tweet this article, share it with your friends, you know, post it somewhere where you know, people will read it discuss it on GitHub um, or email me. Um, I'd love to hear from you what you think about this um, and which kind of topics you'd like to hear more about or what else I should be writing about. Um, I'm interested in having great conversations, so just reach out to me. Thank you so much for listening or watching and have a great day.